why would I give up those blessings? Mm. Confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. Why would you not want that blessing? Your father is, you, you call it a lay pastor in a Protestant church? Correct. So how does that go? Hey, dad, I'm kind of <laughs> asking questions and I'm finding some answers here. How, how did that go? If God said so and God designed it like this and it's clear in scripture and church fathers and church history and all of these things, why am I making it complicated by denying that part of the faith? We're at a time when I think that there's going to be a lot of uh, realization uh, of missing pieces. Just, you know, I, I, I don't know how else to say it other than just missing pieces of the yeah. puzzle. This is it. This is the foundation of who you become. It's a transformation, essentially. Uh, I can clearly recall where the Lord spoke to my spirit and said, you can either continue to be part of this world or you can pick up your cross and follow me. Welcome back to the COA podcast. We have another very special guest with us today and Father Gabriel, who you know for sure. We have with us Chad Long, who's a brother in Christ, a brother in the Orthodox Church, Coptic Orthodox Church. And he has a very special and uh, not usual journey, right? I would say it's a, it's a very interesting journey, a uh, journey with Christ. He says it's a continuous journey with Christ. So he's going to talk with us today shed some light on a few things and uh, enlighten us all. And hopefully we all come out of this with uh, a lot of new outlooks on what we speak of. Chad, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. It's an honor to be here. <laughs> Father, welcome. Paul. Well, I mean, it's your place, so welcome. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Chad, take us from the beginning. What color was your first blanket as a child? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and, so tell us, tell us from the beginning, your, your spiritual journey. Uh, what did it look like? So from the beginning, uh, I grew up in uh, a Christian home, a uh, God-fearing Christian home uh, in the Protestant church. Um, my, my, I, I couldn't have asked for more. Um, my parents, uh, it was me and my sister. Uh, we grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, just inside the city. Um, and my parents took us to church every day, uh, every Sunday. Um, and we had a great, um, great upbringing as uh, kids in, in, the, in the Christian faith. And you were telling me earlier also you, you were homeschooled. I was, yes. So it was either uh, Baltimore City Schools because uh, we did not have enough money for the private schools or um, we would be homeschooled. And I was homeschooled all the way through um, under an umbrella called CHEN, a Christian Homeschool Ed Education Network. Um, and my mom uh, was uh, very sacrificial with her mm -hmm. life and uh, homeschooled my, myself and my sister all the way through. All props to your dad, but any mother who's willing to spend every day with her children at home, coming from someone who has four kids, that's a saint <laughs> right there, straight to heaven. Abs she, she bypasses everyone else, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And I have three kids of my own right now, and we're attempting to do the same thing with Oh, uh, really? Are you homeschooling? Yeah, right that's now, awesome. yeah. That's Our cool. oldest is only four, um, but uh, you know, right now we're just beginning. Yeah, I don't have that mental strength. I don't. I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Luckily, we're blessed. We have we have beautiful Catholic school here that uh, our, our children get to go to. So, similar values as the Orthodox Church. So, so we're lucky. But you have power to you. Power to you. So, tell me, church growing up when you were young, what did that look like? Yeah. So uh, originally, um, we as a child, I was going to the Presbyterian Church. Um, uh, later in life, uh, my parents, uh, went to a, what we would call a non-denominational, uh, Christian church. Uh, and I've always had great, uh, what, what I would, I would say great pastors and leaders in my life through my Christian walk. Mm -hmm. And your parents very devout very kind of bible study together or a prayer together yeah so even from my grandparents my whole family mm -hmm. um would identify as christians believers uh, but my parents are a product of the presbyterian uh you know and the protestant uh listeners would understand when i say steve green and billy graham so my 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 family is a product of uh the blessings that they receive from them and was your relationship with god like as a child was it kind of just mimicking what your parents had, or did you feel like you had a, a deep kind of understanding of who God was? I would say it had I had an understanding of who God was. Mm -hmm. um, the relationship came much later. Um, 
you know, I, I, I can be thankful now. I know that God was watching over me because I would get caught very quickly if I did something wrong, <laughs> 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 which I used to see as a curse, but now I see as a blessing. Because mm-hmm. um, like any good father, uh, I was disciplined very quickly. Um, and I can see God's hand in my life from a very young age. So, mm-hmm. and, and your surroundings, friends, everyone, same community, same Christian upbringing. I, I imagine being homeschooled, there wasn't a lot of outside. For of- the, for the most part, um, I had good friends, uh, that were still in the, the local neighborhood. Um, but I was definitely influenced, influenced, not always in the best way, um, by friends outside of the church. Mm-hmm. Um, and also inside of the church, you know, there's influences that you receive that are uh, good and bad in both places. So I told everyone that, that you have a you had a spiritual journey and it's a continuous journey. At clearly, there's going to be a turn somewhere. <laughs> so, at what point did you go from happy go lucky kind of this is the faith my parents gave me I follow in every footstep kind of to starting to ask questions like what what was that point in your life where you start to ask so for me uh when i was about 18 when i moved out of my parents home uh i disconnected from the church community as a whole uh even the protestant church uh and it took until uh 2015 for me to really hit a a a breaking point uh in my personal life um and i i really uh got broken to the point um where I didn't know what else to do. And in that moment, uh, I can clearly recall where the Lord spoke to my spirit and said, you can either continue to be part of this world or you can pick up your cross and follow me. Mm -hmm. Um, And so from that time on, uh, I've continuously just, uh, you know, like Matthew 7, 7 says, it says, uh, ask and you shall receive, seek and uh, you will find Mm -hmm. and uh, knock and the door will be opened. And he just keeps on opening that door. So, so that would take us. You said twenty fifteen. You're how old? Uh, twenty seven. Okay, so from eighteen to twenty seven, there was kind of like a, a chasm a, there, a very gray area where I was just disconnected from the church completely. So, if you don't mind me asking, what does that look like? A gray area? Do you still believe, or you? Start I still to- believed. I never lost my faith in Christ. Mm-hmm. I just um, maybe lost my understanding of what church was for. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, not to necessarily say I ever thought it was just a social gathering, um, but I didn't see the the need for it in everyday life. Um, but I paid dearly for that, right? So as I was from 18 to 27, there was a lot of, you know, some things which we would say was okay. Um, but uh, in, in the end, uh, you know, the consequences of stepping away and doing things on my own fully disconnected me from the path that I should be on. So take me through it. You're, you're kind of Christian, but not really very Christian until a point in your life where you said, you know, you got hit by circumstances and it was the lowest point of your life. Not going into the details of the circumstances, but when you hit that low point, you think back to yourself, which permutation of God or, or church are you going to at that point? Like, do you, do you immediately go back to the one where you're kind of being homeschooled by mom at home? Do you go back to, what do you start to think there? Sure. Yeah. So all I knew is I needed to get back to church. And, and so the closest one to me was called Grace Community. And I connected with a pastor there, um, uh, which uh, I thank God for every day. He walked me through the book of Romans, um, mm-hmm. really showed me my my you know my the depth of my sin um and the the need that i had for a savior and uh i you know i met with him for a, a few weeks um continuously as he walked me through that journey um and and you know it was everything that i was foundationally i i, I grew up with um, but then there was still just a longing for, uh, you know, the missing pieces of the puzzle that I was asking when I was younger, um, you know, uh, more of a depth and an understanding of, uh, you know, we'll get into this probably later in the discussion, <laughs> like the Eucharist and uh, mm-hmm. communion and salvation, what that looks like. But was that immediate? Like that in 
at a low point, you start to think of these deep things right away? Or are you just uh, thinking like, how do I get out of this hole kind of thing? Yeah, I would say within that first six months, really, it was uh, a very quick, fast journey um, back to the foundations of what I had originally known. So you get back to what you had originally known right away, you want to kind of almost look for more. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know if it's uh, the more would be the right um, deeper, I guess. A depth, I yeah, a depth, the missing uh, missing pieces to the puzzle that I mm-hmm. always had. I think from a young age. So you had those questions. I, I guess. did. Mm-hmm. So you you always felt there was something missing. Um, I I always um, I, I would say I, there was different theologies and doctrines and teachings that um, you know. Uh, like, you know, punchlines like eternal salvation, um, you know, just sim- simple um, references to asking to about communion, the depth of it, mm-hmm. you know, whether or not it's just a remembrance, um, if there's any more depth to the mystery of that. But forgive me, like being brought up Protestant, how do you even know or about the concept of communion outside what you're taught? Like yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the simple fact is that I, I no longer was seeking after just a community um, for a relationship for people in this world, right? So, when I started asking the pastor questions, uh, he started coming back with answers that I, I realized that I had when I was young. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's also what led me into seeking, um, you know, the, the Messianic Jewish community that I went to for a few months, uh, you know, like after that first six months. Uh, I, I stepped into a Messianic Jewish community um, to just really understand the roots of our, our of our faith, understand the Old Testament teachings more. The you know understanding the Passover. Uh, to, just forgive my ignorance. Is, is that like kind of like a Jews for Christ kind of thing, where they're still Jewish but believe that Jesus is the Messiah? Like how does that- so uh, essentially, they are um, you know just like with the Coptic Orthodox, uh, the Coptic would be Egyptian uh, Jewish believers uh, in, that Jesus is the Messiah. So mm-hmm. um, they they believe that Jesus Christ is their Savior and Lord, and they also believe that He is the Messiah that came. So. So you came from Presbyterian, <laughs> then you had questions. So you went to Messianic Jews. Sorry, is that what you call them? Mm-hmm. There's not denominational before, no? Hmm? Not denominational at some point as well. Uh, yeah. So r- right in the beginning, right, um, I I went to Grace Community Church to talk to that pastor, and then mm-hmm. as that yeah. journey kind of progressed. So so take us through it. You're you're now in a. Do they still call them synagogues or? Uh, no, it's uh, still, yeah, it's still considered a, a church, church. church. Yeah. So you're sitting. What are the questions now that are? coming in like the unmet is like what, what's the confusion now <laughs> yeah i mean again so the practices right the the traditions right what is what is required by us by the law um you know did christ do away with all of all of the law right there's mm-hmm. a lot of different teachings that are out there um and and they don't believe that they're doing something in an act of uh working for their salvation it's also working out their salvation and it's also seeing christ in all of um the feast uh, mm-hmm. of the old testament which is lovely i mean that the, the sacrifice is the old testament it's you can see christ in all of them it's incredible it, it's right? very liturgical it's very in, deep, in a way yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I guess the main question is, you're going through these kind of different question-answer periods and and the motions and hopping around. Is this met by a thirst for more, a dissatisfaction of kind of the answers you're getting? Like, what's that look like? I I know a lot of people that are asking questions or might feel the same way you feel. So, I just kind of clarify the feeling, the emotions behind it. You know, it could be helpful, I think. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think if you're not willing to challenge uh, the, what you're, you know, what you're brought up with and what you're taught uh, from a young age, if you're not willing to understand the other side of the the coin per se, right? If you're not willing to challenge your own viewpoint from a young child, then um, then you're. It's a difficult thing to grow uh, to to really uh, seek the Lord with all your heart um, and all your mind on your own without your parents' perspective, without any other perspective, because God will lead you. Uh, you know, if you ask a question, he'll guide you. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, he, he won't leave you alone in that. And so for me, he knew that was the journey that I needed to take to get to where I am today. But what was, what was driving, you know, what was driving that? I'm kind of fascinated at the idea that someone's like sitting down and 
they have their you know faith and they they go through a hard time okay I'll, I'll step back up on you know get back on the horse and you know read my scriptures more and go see my pastor more like what's driving you to be like i need to find answers you know it's it's a strange uh, not a lot of people young people go yeah through. i mean i think for me like i said when i hit that moment and when you hear and when i when i felt the lord speak to my spirit and say do you want to continue to be part of mm -hmm. this world and you see the devastation in this world today mm. um, when you realize that you're a part of that when you can continue to be a part of the 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 sin and the devastation um and that christ wants us to follow him so that we don't have to be part of that mm -hmm. any longer uh, you'll pretty much do anything that you need to do uh, mm -hmm. to find him, you know, to, mm -hmm. and he says, if you seek, you'll find. Mm. So were you dissatisfied with certain answers you would get, be getting, let's say, in terms of the Eucharist or, or whatnot? Or? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I've always struggled with, uh, you know, more of the punchline answer, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and again, I, I am deeply uh, grateful for all of the pastors that are in my life and i i don't think it had to do with any um intentional deception or deceiving uh it's just um you know you know we were talking and and it's it's the understanding of you know where we came from the reformation mm -hmm. and um where that led us and you know it's it's what we had right it's what also they they had as a, an offer it's um there's a lot of things of pieces of the puzzle that are missing mm -hmm. uh and and i think they stand in the same spot that i did with some of those questions to be honest with you mm -hmm. so where do those questions take you how did you get to a point where you found orthodoxy or well so those questions took me to zambia africa <laughs> lovely all right take us there first that's a better question <laughs> yeah. you're better than this than i am all right so um, those questions take you to zambia yeah so uh you know through through that journey in 2018 um I, you know I, I continued to just seek the lord with everything i had and i wanted to serve uh when i was young um my parents took me on a mission trip to the dominican republic um and so uh, you know even back then it rooted in me was a love one for travel and then um i love to serve beach and preach right <laughs> that's right, that's <laughs> that's right. Beach and preach. the two-week drop in right <laughs> <laughs> but i wanted something more in that too so i said to the lord i said if it's your if it's your will if it's your intention i want to serve long term i want to do something uh a longer term and i i want you to work in me and through me uh in in that time so uh i just i opened myself up to it and there was an opportunity uh where there's a mission called all kids can learn zambia uh, village of hope uh in zambia africa and um they were looking for somebody to come work with the kids and then also my background is the electrical field um so they were looking to do a solar project there so I, uh, I, I quit my job in 2018, um, with Schneider Electric. And it was kind of one of those trust steps that I had to take with the Lord. I had to sell my house and quit my career job. And, um, you know, well, you weren't doing this half, half. you, you go you actually go to sold Africa. Your house. I, I sold everything I had Full and I left in. with, uh, with a bag in my hand. Yeah. Nice. And then how does that, yeah. how does that go when you get to Zambia and you have no more house and no more job and. So, um, I, I, you know, at the time I pretty much opened the door and said, I'll stay as long as the Lord leads. I didn't know what that looked like. Um, can I just ask out of curiosity what mom's saying at this point, if you're halfway across the world, <laughs> she's like, I did this too. I homeschooled you. <laughs> she absolutely did. And you know, now I, I currently live right next door to my parents. So I think oh, she right. was pray, she praying pretty back. hard okay, to get back a uh, parent's yeah. prayers. Very strong. Yeah. Especially um, a mother, isn't it? Yeah. But, uh, she supported it all the way. She actually, the first trip that we took there was just a short term mission, uh, early 2018. And she went with me. Um, wow. so her and, um, my, my father went with me for that first trip. And at that time I didn't know that I was going to go there full time. Um, but by the time we left, I think I know that I knew that I was going back full time and I think they knew as well. Hmm. All right. Take us after that. Where, where do we get to the, the part where you, you find some form of orthodoxy or sure. some answer? Sure. Yeah. So then I'm still seeking, right? And, and in Africa, the, if you've ever been, uh, they will teach you more than you could ever teach them. Uh, you will receive more than you could ever, uh, offer them. Uh, uh but, uh, 
it was about uh i think a, a month into my stay there um i met my now wife uh marianne who uh who is from the coptic orthodox church uh she was there uh for that stay just for a short-term mission trip back um she had previously lived uh in zambia and lusaka at the coptic mission in lusaka uh she got connected to the non-denominational uh christian mission uh called all kids can learn uh, when she was li living there um and she was just going back to visit and that's when uh we bumped into each other so then you bump into each other but that's not why you became orthodox it's certainly not <laughs> <laughs> in fact that only came after absolutely so you were telling us you got married in the protestant church we did so you you pulled her towards you right into the protestant church and then what happens after that that makes you start questioning or uh i mean like you, you know like you've heard in my story um it's it's been a longing and, and a searching uh for a depth of an understanding of of our faith um and and um it's something that never left uh when i was in zambia it gave me a lot of time to think um and when i met uh marianne uh you know things developed pretty quickly uh the realization that um you know this was from god um and then the questioning of of the orthodox church the realization that i believed that uh not only did god put her in front of me uh you know um as a partner as a spouse um but um as I was questioning and growing, um, I realized that, uh, you know, she had uh, the connection with the Coptic Orthodox Church um, that I was very interested in uh, and that I was learning from. But um, I did not want to, what we, you know, necessarily step into the church just because mm -hmm. um, we wanted to get married. Well, it was not, not an, an intention in any way. And that was not her intention in any way also. Uh, just a, a background note for people to, to know, your father is, you, you call it a lay pastor in, in a Protestant church? R correct. So, how does that go? Hey, Dad, I'm kind of <laughs> asking questions and I'm finding some answers here. How, how did that go? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that you would find that so many, um, we, we don't have that many differences in, in between the heart of uh of a Protestant believer and an Orthodox believer. I think that there is a depth in the Orthodox Church um, that we uh, have lacked, that we are that we are missing. Um, but with my father, we've always, always had a very good relationship, very close relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, at first there was some slight concerns of, uh, you know, me questioning certain things, but it's not something new. Uh, for me to question, obviously, mm -hmm. in the Messianic Jewish congregation, and uh, it's something that I was uh, seeking out prior to this relationship. Your mom too. wasn't like pulling out her hair, saying, "Why are you joining the dark side?" or anything. <laughs> you know, that wasn't. <laughs> well, the, a lot of our understanding in in the West and in, in America, right, is uh, you, you see something like that, and most of our reference is only the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So that's really the only reference that she has to the Orthodox Church. And Reformation, you're telling me, was because of a lot of problematic things in the Roman Catholic Church. So, for them, I, did they know anything about Orthodoxy at the time, or the no. differences between it and the, no? No, we didn't. Know, they didn't know anything about it, nor did I. Um, <laughs> and you know, I, I I did a good bit of studying on my own uh, from what I could find, um, but it was never necessarily uh, into the Orthodox Church. Hmm. So. Take us through now the answers. You start to, to read or to do your homework and you, you're starting to get some of these answers to the questions that, you know, weren't answered before since you were young. Sure. First of them, I'm assuming, is probably Eucharist? Um, you know, that's that's one of them. First was actually um, baptism. Mm. Um, but you were baptized Protestant, right? I was. in So, in 2015, mm. uh, I was baptized uh, at Grace Community. Uh, is that like usually the, the the way it is? You get baptized as an adult, kind of thing. Uh, yeah, so it's a believer's baptism. Okay. Um, you know, and one of the things is is that I was brought up in the church, but I never did get full water, water baptized until 2015. Mm. Even within the Protestant church, uh, it's just something that you know 
I, I still question to this day um, of why it wasn't asked more, uh, you know, <laughs> about my faith and why I never took that step of faith myself, but I never did until 2015. So, and then you, so baptism, what was that first understanding that, you know, in, through the orthodox eyes kind of thing? Sure. Yeah. It's, 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 m- much much deeper than i ever understood you know it's uh it's from from death to life you know baptized in christ and um you know it, that that depth and understanding was never there uh for me before um and so father peter uh from sbsb uh he was one of the first priests that i actually talked to and uh he took some time mm-hmm. to walk me through all of those details and to help me understand what was actually happening so you used to believe that was just a symbol, essentially, that the Protestant baptism, or, or there's more depth to it than that? M- m- more of a more of a symbol, okay. you know. It, it, most believe that it's a yes, a requirement, but mm-hmm. um, you know, not essential. Uh, and again, I don't want to speak for all Protestants mm-hmm. and 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 every denomination, um, but it was not essential uh, as it is in the Orthodox Church. Mm-hmm. So why would it be required if it's a symbol? It's like a more of a commitment type of thing. Like, what's the idea behind that? It always, uh, yeah, yeah. I never understood that. I, I think yeah. that's the struggle that mm-hmm. um, many have and that I had as well, just the same as the Eucharist and understanding the mysteries, the spiritual mysteries that are actually taking place in that event, in that act. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think um, if you talk to many Protestants and you were open enough to have the conversations, a lot of them would question the same thing. Mm-hmm. But even the whole, I mean, the Holy Spirit and chrismation and, it's in the Acts of the Apostles. Like even those who got baptized in water had to go and get the laying on of hands. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So to me, I always wonder, and, and this is by no means, I, I'm not trying to do like a Protestant versus Catholic versus Orthodox. I just, I just want understanding for the mindset on the other side. When someone who's Protestant reads that passage, right, about laying on of hands, what is the answer? To, it's, it's very, you know, it, it's a clear thing or even communion, you know, we were even talking before, I'm like, I, give me the answer. I want to feel better about the argument against, you know, Christ says, if you do not eat my, my body and drink my blood, you have no part in me. He says, my, my, my flesh is food indeed. My sure. blood is drink indeed. It, there's no negotiation. Yeah. To it, right? like what, you, what's the explanation to that yeah if you, if you read john 6 54 it mm-hmm. says who ev- whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood uh, has eternal life and i will raise him up in the last day mm-hmm. um it, you know if you read through john 6 and you understand what he's talking about spiritually um you know it's no for for me uh, and this is for me in my journey it was no doubt uh that there was much more of a mystery to the eucharist than i originally understood Mm-hmm. And even baptism, right? Romans six four, right? When we we are crucified and buried with Christ, and we receive newness of life in in the baptism, I put on Christ, like Saint Paul says, I believe in Colossians. Right? So so it's very clear that baptism in itself is not just a symbol. But I guess I mean when you're brought up in a certain way, you read a verse in a specific way, right? You just take it for for granted essentially. I think that's what happens. Absolutely. We also yeah. don't have the church father teaching. Yeah. So when you have the roots of the church fathers, um we I didn't grow up with the church fathers. So tell the me about writings. That for a second. Sorry to cut you off. Sure. But like I understand there's a period in history where it's very problematic. The Catholic Church had a lot of very strange things and heretical things, if, if we can even call it that. But there's like a thousand years before that of, of the ancient church father. I mean, the Orthodox Creed is, how old is the Orthodox Creed father? What year was the council? 325 and 381. After. So we're, we're talking about 16, 1700 year old Orthodox Creed. You know, St. Athanasius, the Apostolic, I mean, these are no small sure. pillars of faith. Like, wh- why not negate, like, what's the answer to it? Why not negate the part that's problematic in the history, but go back to that, you know, ancient part, you know? I think we're at a stage that we um, are, are are able to link the missing pieces of the puzzle, right? Mm-hmm. So, if you're from and born from the Reformation, uh, from Luther down from John Calvin, and that's the only teaching and understanding that you had as a resource. And I mean, now we live in the age of 
technology <laughs> and information, right? <laughs> yeah, it can uh, it can be a blessing and a curse, right? You can go down many different rabbit holes, but you have channels uh, like like this one mm-hmm. um, that are open to talking about these mm-hmm. differences uh, of 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 maybe just a language difference uh, between the Oriental Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, you know, we're we're at a time when I think that there's going to be a, a lot of uh, realization uh, of missing pieces just you know I, I i don't know how else to say it other than just missing pieces of the yeah. puzzle right it would be so delight i mean the world is crumbling all around us it would be so lovely to unite as brothers and sisters in christ it would be incredible yeah, to have absolutely if we can't do that as believers then how do we expect the world to see christ in us mm-hmm. so now you've been brought up with you know protestant teachings and reformation all that good stuff You walk into your first uh, Orthodox liturgy (laughs) and there's a man dressed in a long robe and he's, you know, incensing the church with incense and, you know, bowing down to icons. I'm sure at that point you're about to walk out and run (laughs) and be like everything mom taught me, like this is not it. Uh, Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's one of those things I had to kind of, um, I had to be prepared to unlearn a lot of things that I knew that were not correct taught to me in the past Mm -hmm. um and and i also already at that stage was talking to priests directly i mean from 2015 i would go to pastors directly and ask questions i would you know and and in the messianic jewish congregation i would talk to the rabbi and you know and when i understood of the orthodox faith faith i I went to priests and i've had um you know the blessing of speaking to so many priest you know uh in in toronto uh, you know there was father paul in the byzantine church Mm -hmm. um you know i was able to speak with him over multiple times uh you know during covid um and and he helped me immensely through my journey um and you know uh, father gabriel uh, also in zambia uh father abraham fam uh he he was very close uh to the mission that i was working and i've met with him several times as well he's a coptic orthodox he is yes yeah he is he's now in washington dc and leesburg stsa Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so but i i just want to live the comedy of the moment you walk in and you see (laughs) incense what are you thinking to yourself it was it was tough it's difficult it's uncomfortable right Right. so anything new is uncomfortable um but i was excited i i I saw something new i saw something that was i I could see in the scriptures right i could i could see it i could smell it i could live it i could breathe it right Mm -hmm. it was something that was a reference of reverence that i've never seen before Mm -hmm. Uh, a reverence for the word and if you listen to the liturgy and you listen to the words that are being said um you know that that's why i was there at first not for the the visuals um not for anything else other than just listening uh listening to what was being prayed so how many times up till now did you have to explain to family members or friends who are protestant we don't worship saints but we ask them to pray for us like we ask each other to pray for us it's pretty common conversation common that we conversation. have all the time but it's a hard thing to to unlearn and relearn to mm-hmm. understand what that is yeah i mean even when they bring the paralytic to, to Christ, he says, because of their faith, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Like it's, intercession's always been there. Absolutely. Same thing with icons. How do you explain our veneration of icons and, you know? Yeah. And that's still a process, you know, to be, mm. to be honest, you know, I, so I was uh, baptized in the Orthodox Church in 2021. Mm. Um, and all of these things, you know, I'm, I'm still in, in the infant stages of my, uh, so tell me, what's the hardest walk. one for you? What, what's the most difficult? part of this stage is there still something hurdles or things you constantly ask about or what were the hurdles in the beginning i I think the the hurdles that i currently have now are um how do i share this with my friends and family um i you know i i obviously uh and not because uh, of my marriage am i in the coptic orthodox church it's because of my own searching and my own journey uh, you got remarried orthodox we did we did so um in 2021 when i you know decided uh, that i would be baptized in the orthodox church we also were married in the orthodox church mm-hmm. in 2021 i'm actually pretty curious about this like what what are your feelings in, in getting rebaptized but orthodox right uh, your first eucharist uh re- getting remarried so to speak uh, but orthodox like what are your feelings uh what's going through your mind you and marianne sure yeah i mean it was a solidification uh, you know it it solidified all of those things uh mm-hmm. for me and my heart um it, it wasn't um it didn't make me feel like what was 
uh, had to be done away with. Um, mm. You know, one of the explanations that one of the priests helped me walk through and he said, this is a from glory to glory. Mm. Um, mm, that's nice. Uh, you know, Second Corinthians talks about that and in our, yeah. our walk in 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 the Lord, you know, with the Lord, uh, from mm-hmm. glory to glory, uh, from faith to faith, uh, to to understand what that actually is. So for me, it wasn't a replacement of; uh, it was uh, it was a stepping into mm-hmm. uh, a, a, a a deeper understanding. Mm-hmm. And and the feelings you had that day, anything special? Any any good memories? Any? I mean, yeah. So I mean, I, I was baptized with my daughter. Uh, oh, my first that's daughter. Awesome. Oh, so that's nice. uh, you know, uh, yeah, we we did uh, how many sacraments that day? So we were married that day. Uh, I, I was baptized that day. Uh, my daughter was baptized that day as well. Uh, well you really had confession. the priest working overtime that day. <laughs> <So> <laughs> it was COVID times as well. Oh, okay. So <laughs> thank God it's free, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So it was a very special moment. Um, my parents were also there. Uh, they supported uh, and they've supported every step of this. Mm-hmm as well and uh do they have questions do they sit down and just grill you sometimes or just ask questions my father and i we we talk about things all the time and uh yeah we're we're very open with the conversation but is it more like a kind of uh friendly banter kind of talk of like well prove this to me prove that or is it genuinely like it's genuine it's genuine uh you know i think when you start seeing things in the scripture and you're seeing things in the word and you just see it for what it is it's it's not something to be feared Mm. Yeah, uh, open dialogue I mean, with other worship, believers. We, we worship the same person. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, uh, yes, y- yes, and and no. Sometimes, right? So, right, uh, to which question? Yes, uh, we, I don't think we can easily always say we worship the same person. Um, mm. Most, yes, uh, but there are forty thousand, over forty thousand denominations of uh, Protestants and. Uh, and and oftentimes in in my early understanding of who God was, I would not say that it was the same understanding that I have today. But explain that to me though. Like, can I just open my own denomination of a Protestant church and call myself a pastor? Like, how does that work? Like, how can you have forty thousand different creeds? Or you know what I mean? Like, the Apostolic churches have one united creed. Like the Orthodox churches have. Sure. One, you know what I mean? It's. Well, the Orthodox churches have a united creed, but the Protestant churches, it's, what is it? It's, it's like a, yeah, I mean, everyone has a different understanding, right? Um, so they have to state everyone their understanding. has their own statement of theology and, and doctrine. Um, every denomination has that as well. But based on and, what? And some are closer to what we would say, uh, the Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church, if you can try to compare that, but it's it's difficult in today's time um, because, uh, like you said, anybody can open up their own church, and uh, you really have to be aware of what's happening and where you're worshiping and what they believe. So let me ask you a question as an outsider, not as an Orthodox person, because this is the one I get a lot. I get it at work. I get it all over the place. Some people come and tell me, I feel like we're, you guys and your churches and all that are, are boxing in Christ. You know, why can't I have a relationship with Christ by myself, me and him and pray to him directly? Why do I need a priest to tell him my sins when I can confess straight to God? Why do I need a, you know, absolution? Why do I, what's the answer now that you have both vantage points? Yeah. I mean, for me, it's why would I give up those gifts? Why would I give up those blessings? Mm. confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed why would you not want that blessing uh if it's if it's in the scriptures right um james in the book of james it talks about um working out your salvation and fear and trembling it's not a working for uh it's it's not boxing in god it's uh uh it's controlling our own desires for sin right uh naturally by myself i know where i took myself uh in the church in the church community um with these sacraments with these blessings that that he has left for us um why would i step away why would i step away from that well well, the funny part with this question is as if it implies that having a priest having these sacraments are like these additional things that make things or christianity so so complicated but in reality, this is how God designed it. 
Absolutely. So, so, so when I ask that question, you know, like the, the simple answer is obviously there's a lot of theology here that I, I mean, I don't think it's the place for it here, but, but, um, the simple answer is because, because God said so. So when I, if God said so and God designed it like this and it's clear in scripture and church fathers and church history and all of these things, why am I making it complicated by denying that part of the faith? Sure. Or telling someone else that may be leaning towards that as a blessing, telling them that it's not required or not yeah. needed. Uh, you know, you know, from the Reformation too, we have to also understand that a lot of things were used in the wrong way, mm -hmm. um, but properly used, uh, proper, properly applied. Uh, it's an it's a blessing. Yeah, it's a spiritual uh, father. It's very free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and the Eucharist. Uh, we were talking before, and you're telling me. I was, I was asking you. I was puzzled. I was like, "There's, there's no place for negotiation. This is the body and the true body and blood of Christ." And you're telling me that it always goes back to do this in remembrance of me. Sure. Yeah. And 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 I think many people have questions just like I did as well. But if you, like I said, look at uh, you know, just read through John six, read through what he was saying. It was very difficult for them to understand that then as well. Uh, you know, many of his disciples left. Uh, many many of the followers mm -hmm. left. Yeah. Uh, it was very difficult to understand to see the mystery of what that actually is. But I think if we, um, you know, we really sit on that and we really press into that mm -hmm. you, you we'll see how we're partaking in truly the body and the blood of christ mm -hmm. and, and what's that if you don't mind me asking communion to you now like before you didn't have communion now you have it what has that added to you in your relationship with god yeah i mean it's 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 at the core of of our liturgy right it's at the core of our faith it's thanksgiving it's christ at the core of our worship right mm -hmm. so it's um it's everything it's why we come together uh, it's how we come together it's the reason that we come together mm -hmm. and it's bringing you from glory to glory like th th this is it this is the foundation of who you become it's a transformation essentially like the theosis of of becoming in the likeness of god through this mystery so it's it's very transformative and that's why orthodoxy is so deep um and forgive me, I just want to go back to something about this idea of do this in remembrance of me. Like if, if we notice, like if I read do this in remembrance of me, it says nowhere that it's a symbol. So, so me remembering something does not equate that it's a symbol. So it seems like it's something that again has been passed on and from one generation to the next. And therefore when we, some Protestant he hears, this sentence or this phrase he automatically you know thinks as a, of a symbol but in reality the word anamnesis in, in greek it means to to relive this so whatever christ is doing with them at the last supper he's telling them relive this so his body is still real like take eat this is my body take drink this is my blood body blood but relive this so so this is what we do in liturgy every time whether it's on sunday or weekdays so this is the proper understanding um so i i thought i thought that it's very important for us to understand that it do this in remembrance of me does not mean it's symbolism in any way chad let me ask you something because i have a, a colleague who shall rename nameless because i don't want to put anyone on the <laughs> spot but i have a colleague who recently joined the orthodox church and her biggest hurdle when it comes to attending liturgy is I feel like a poser. Mm. I feel like I don't understand anything and I'm just going through the motions. I feel like a hypocrite walking into the church and I look around me, everyone has their hands in the air. Well, not like hands in the air, like, you know, but like <laughs> with their hands in prayer. And I don't understand anything. That's what she's, her words, you know, and I feel like I'm just going through the motions to take communion that I don't really comprehend because she's a newcomer to the Orthodox faith right newcomer to the faith period to be honest with you no no deep foundation before that what's your answer what how do you tell the, the, a person like that the importance of it without making them feel that you know they're hypocrite yeah i mean i think anything that we do we have to have an understanding of why we're doing it um but also sometimes we have to begin a process 
and get into the pattern. And sometimes it starts to work in you. When you pick up your Bible for the first time, sometimes it can be overwhelming. If you've never picked up the scriptures, I had the blessing of having a Bible in my hand when I was young, uh, understanding. But if you do that alone, um, it's, it's very overwhelming. So, uh, you know, I would recommend making sure that you have someone. I, I have the blessing of being married, uh, to, uh, my wife, uh, so I can ask many questions, but most of the questions I go directly to, uh, the priest, um, you know, and, and I would encourage anybody that, that is doing it. Don't do things out of a, don't always just, if you feel like a hypocrite, don't just do it. Um, understand why you're doing it and, and ask the questions. Um, but sometimes just like with working out, sometimes you just have to go through the motions mm -hmm. and then you'll see the results. Um, you know, it doesn't always feel like something's happening necessarily. And it's not always about our feelings and emotions because those can't always be trusted as well. Um, and sometimes we need to push ourselves into doing good things and inside things will continue to change. And sorry, and the question, I guess, to both of you, because I get asked this one a lot. People who don't want to go through other mediators like a priest or whatever, be just want to have their relationship with Christ on their own. What is both of your answers to that? <laughs> <laughs> My answer is simple. You're free to do so, but know that this is not how Christ designed it. It's, it's, it's not biblical. It's not historical. Uh, early on uh, in church history, you see very clearly who's a bishop, who's a priest, how he's there, how he's remission, remitting the sins. It's there. Why is it that in John 20, the day of the resurrection in the evening, right? So this is 50 days prior to Pentecost where the Christians receive the Holy Spirit and it's the beginning of the church. 50 days prior, Christ appears in the evening, right, to the disciples, to the 12 only, not to everybody, blows in their mouths and tells them, receive the Holy Spirit. Wait, wait a second, what does that mean? So, so they receive the Holy Spirit 50 days later. Who receives the Holy Spirit twice? Anybody believes we receive the Holy Spirit twice? Of course not. You're a Christian once and that's it, right? Nobody rebaptizes, right? Mm. But he tells them, receive the Holy Spirit. He blows in their mouth and he tells them, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. He's telling the apostles, the 12, right? Or the 11 at the time, right? If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Please explain to me why in the world would Christ do this if it wasn't just plainly the case? Receive the Holy Spirit. He's not joking around. He's giving the Holy Spirit. So here the idea is that he's giving a different grace of the Holy Spirit. He's ordaining them as bishops. So the apostles were, were bishops, but also were witnesses and the evangelized. That's what they're called apostles. But part of the function of an apostle is to be a bishop. And therefore, and then, and you can see it also in between St. Paul and St. Timothy, how St. Paul ordained St. Timothy and told him to ordain other people and to select them properly. Um, so again, like it's just, we have to unlearn a lot of things to be able to realize the, the truth of these mysteries. And often what will clarify things is that we have to go back to church history. For example, one, one of the perfect examples you mentioned in earlier, Chad, when we're speaking about confess to one another, right? So some people take this verse and to say, well, hey, I can confess to Paul. Mm. I can confess to Chad. I can confess to no. <laughs> so, so in the early church, people within a liturgical setting would confess their sins publicly in front of the bishop as well. Mm. So this confessing to one another is because we're in liturgy, right? Or about to start liturgy, whatever it was. Chad is there, Paul is there, the bishop is there. I'm confessing my sins out loud, therefore confessing to one another. But there's someone that is there that is absolving me, hmm. right? So when I understand these things, I realize, wait a second, all the pieces of the puzzle are fitting together, right? So it gives me a completely different perspective rather than picking a verse out of context and to say, well, look, I can confess to anybody. So funny enough, when we talk about this, so so even those that would use this verse would rather not confess to someone else, mm. but they would confess directly to God. So the, the real problem here 
is that I do not want to divulge my sins or to expose myself to someone else who is human. I'm afraid of judgment, right? And so therefore, that, that's the main reason. Then I ask myself, well, why, right? But again, this is the design of God. And what we find in the beauty of the priesthood and why we call the priest of fathers that there's a, a spiritual fatherhood, there's, there's a follow-up, there's a, a beautiful relationship. It's not judgmental, right? And there's, there's more importantly, a discipleship. You know, I, I believe you confessed to Father Peter, mm, right? I'm yes. correct. Yeah. So, so, so as imagine, you know, I know you live in the state, but the states, but if you had lived here, like imagine, let's say the relationship you would have with Father Peter, if you would go confess on a monthly basis, how would that look like? Right. So he knows you, you know him, you form that relationship. He's able to guide you and he's telling you, Chad, be careful with this. Pray this, read the scripture here. So it, it, it's beautiful and it, it's mystical, right? So the priest is, is a human being, but he has this, this extra grace that makes Christ present in him, essentially. And therefore, when he is at the altar during liturgy, it is Christ in him who is once again breaking himself in the bread. So 2,000 years ago, Christ is sitting and he, he breaks the bread and says, take, eat, this is my body. So he's breaking his own body. The Son of God is breaking the body of the Son of God. That's essentially what's happening. So the, again, this idea of anamnesis and the reliving of this moment is what liturgy does, right? So, so Christ in the priest once again breaks himself in the bread. But it's not an additional time, it's a participation of the first Last Supper, the first mystical meal, right? So so this is what a priest does. Mm -hmm. He becomes the presence of Christ. And again, this beautiful mystery and relationship that you have with him. So you wanna miss out on all that, you're free. I mean, nobody forces anybody <laughs> to do anything, but, but it, it's truly beautiful. There is a reason we have, so many beautiful youth in the church. There is a reason why, I mean, I can't speak about other Orthodox churches, I'm sure they're doing well as, as well, but, but the Coptic church is doing very well and their pews are, are full. Like the, the main problem that we have, we're not perfect, far from it. I, I don't claim that in any way. Um, but the, one of the main issues that we have is that, you know, like we have too many youth. Like I, I don't know, I don't know who, who <laughs> to deal with. Problem, I don't know who to yeah. disciple anymore. Like it's mm -hmm. insane, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a nice problem to have, and and you have it because that fatherhood is there, mm -hmm. and that discipleship is there. Did you want to answer the same question? I feel like Father. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think he covered that pretty well, and and that's pretty much where I would stand on it as well. Why, you know, why would you want to miss out on the, the mm -hmm. that blessing on that mystery, right? Uh, we we. we somewhat have that in a way in the protestant church um but at a much lower uh capacity mm. um but but uh but it is certainly a blessing mm. and it's certainly certainly a mystery of what happens in that that i would encourage um people to really look at what what's happening there mm -hmm. and uh and to step into that uh, step into that blessing. Mm -hmm. It's something that I'm still getting used to. Uh, it's it's not something that I grew up with, uh, of course, yeah. and it and it is a challenge, and it is uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, again, uh, as I continue to grow in the faith and grow in the Orthodox Church, uh, I'm going to continue to utilize these what I would say uh, blessings uh, of of working out working out my salvation. Mm -hmm. And if I can add to that too, because I guess maybe it would complement it a bit is that speaking, even, you know, people could look at me saying, well, you're a priest, it's easy for you to say, mm -hmm. you know, as if I don't have to confess myself. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> like I personally father run. Father has a father in confession oh, too. Absolutely, yes. yeah. absolutely. And I run to confession. I think of a father of confession might be annoyed at me. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I run, I love to run to confession. Every time, you know, sometimes let's say, something happens like you know like it happens once in a while i get angry for some reason you know like and it's like uncontrolled like even if it's like just for a few seconds you know it's my questions i know you've told me before i told you what before that is because of my question oh no you <laughs> angered me now you're you, <laughs> my, yeah, existence, whole, <laughs> my existence is a whole no, anger yeah. see i told no, you it's gonna no, come no, out i yeah. love you i love uh, you no it's never you yeah. um 
and I try to deal with that anger afterwards in the sense that I try to repent. I try to to I do repent, obviously, and I try to pray about it. What what not like? Still, like I I do not personally. I'm, I'm talking here on a personal experience as someone that goes and confesses regularly. Is that I am not at peace internally until I go to mm-hmm. confession. There's like a lightning of the soul, mm-hmm. uh, almost. You feel like weightless after because yeah, it's a burden that you've given up to your father. But it's not only about like a burden type of thing. It's it's like there's real healing. There's mm-hmm. real reconciliation. There's real healing. So I've been, you know, trying to deal with it for 48 hours, 72 hours, you know, in vain. Go to confession. An hour, two hours later, tops. Wow. In repeat again, and and every time, mm. right? So so this is the, the the actual experience of confession. So when I say these things, it's not coming uh, or from the perspective of a priest because I take confessions. I'm speaking from a perspective of someone that confesses mm. to mm-hmm. another priest. So Chad, people are asking questions, or they have questions about faith. What is your guidance to them? where to start or how this process goes. I think I would go back to Matthew 7, 7. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open. We have to start there. Uh, you, you can't take somebody else's word for it. You have to You have to ask. Um, and be willing to be uncomfortable, uh, you know, depending on where you're coming from. To be willing to uh, walk into a, uh, a place that doesn't look familiar to you mm-hmm. uh, for the reason of uh, seeking the Lord with all your heart, right? Um, it's not always comfortable for me to, to, to walk, into, uh, walk into liturgy, to walk into uh, a Coptic church uh, that they don't know me. Uh, I, I have to, you know, put away a lot of thoughts that are in my own head of I, I don't belong here. I don't look the same. You know, my <laughs> my intentions are not to be uh, e- Egyptian per se. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, my my intentions are to be more Christ like. And when I walk into these places, I've I've always been welcomed uh, with open arms. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. and and I've always been able to you know talk to anyone that's there and talk to any priest that's there. Uh, I've I've never been turned away. I've never. Um, uh, actually, um, you know, some of the thoughts that are in my head of not feeling like I belong, if I continue to press in and, uh, st- st- step, uh, take that step of faith, uh, I've, they've never been confirmed all the thoughts that I have in my head. So mm-hmm. I would say, uh, be willing to be uncomfortable and, uh, you know, step through the door and realize that, uh, things that you've learned in your past, uh, may not necessarily be true. Um, listen to what a people uh, pray and you'll know uh, who they worship Mm -hmm. I have a question you have a question no go ahead you sure go ahead Um, what message would you lovingly send to to Coptic Orthodox congregation members um about you know welcoming others within within their parishes whether uh, it would be culture related language related or whatnot um like what can we learn uh, that would make us better at welcoming people sure i mean you know just keep in mind you have you have this gift this treasure um that's meant to be shared with the entire world um and there's a lot of people that uh, that either know of the Christian faith, were brought up in the Christian understanding that may not be orthodox, uh, that would absolutely love to have what you have mm-hmm. this this treasure that is that 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 is in the Orthodox Church, um, you know. And so, if you're not in- inviting your neighbor, if you're not inviting. Um, if you're you're not loving your neighbor as yourself, right? And invite them, no matter what you may perceive that they will think when they walk through the door. Let God do the rest. Um, but then also realize that it, you know, if if you could, uh, when you see someone that walks in that's not Egyptian, Egyptian, <laughs> <laughs> that we are very lost in that <laughs> setting, right? And so, um, so welcome them in and mm-hmm. and and invite them in. Uh, teach them what are 
uh, the traditions of the Orthodox Church, teach them the difference between uh, the traditions of the culture um, that you that you will see when you walk into uh, you know any Orthodox Church, whether that be uh, the Coptic Church, the Syrian Church, and any one of them. Um, you know, teach them so that they understand what is mm. essential, what what is the gifts, you know, and what is has just come with uh, with time. Yeah, yeah. Is uh, there something we can do better on that perspective? From what you've seen, I know you've you've had the blessing of going to several Orthodox churches, but is there something that we're you know repeatedly doing wrong in terms of our welcoming or of of, of catering to non Egyptian non so, so personally for me, you know, I, I was on a journey that I did not want to necessarily see what I was used to. Um, so I appreciated, uh, what I saw when I walked into the church, but, uh, you know, certainly, um, you know, it, if it should, if it could be expected that newcomers would be there, someone that would sit through with them, uh, welcome them to mm. say, Hey, you, would you like me to sit with you to walk you through the liturgy to explain to you what's going on off to the side? If you have any questions to make sure that person does not leave the church mm. with not understanding, you know, what's happening if they have questions because i think many times that may happen um you know if i was just alone and walked in if i didn't feel necessarily welcomed yeah. um I, maybe i did not belong there um but if somebody was there to help them through that process uh you know mm -hmm. make sure uh I, you know um stsa i feel like is doing a great job uh you know i've been there many times and you know there's many people in the washington dc area that you can see they they do the well um that it's something that uh, it's you know l looks a little bit more uh familiar and it explains what's happening in the liturgy it's after the liturgy so if you wanted to invite somebody to that after church uh and it's kind of a step process um, you, you hear from the priest, um, from something that you're familiar with and, you know, then you can invite them into the liturgy and walk them through that. Um, that would, that would mm. be, be something that's. I have a strong feeling that, you know, your, the, your coworker, like that's what she's missing. I, I have a feeling she yeah. didn't get a, like a catechumen, like classes before. She mm, wasn't explaining. Not just that. It's not a missionary, our church, like the, our unique church, not missionary church. Uh, so language no too. Every church. Uh, no, but language to too, I feel. Yeah. Language has a big part. I feel, I mean, uh, you tell us more, you know, like yeah, but your you have children, to, your, your, yourself, like how, how do you deal with that? If, like, I mean, have you walked into a church where the language is not, you know, English all around? And how does yeah, I mean, so, so, it, you know, it, if I go to St. Mark's even here, I don't speak French, right? So that's very, uh, you know, I don't <laughs> speak Coptic. That's I them trying to be accommodating French, if they're speaking you know, French. Um, so. And, but so I don't, I don't necessarily think that you always have to, you'll never be able to accommodate to every person. It's just not possible. And if you do that, then you just look like the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, sadly in a lot of the Protestant circles, uh, we've tried to look so much like the world and be so welcoming mm. that there's no internal change that's actually happening and people are looking for a change they're not you know you might be comfortable if you listen to a, a song that sounds very familiar mm. to you because it's a secular song um but it's not what people are deep down wanting that change when when you're looking for that um it'll it'll get you comfortable and make you feel you know satisfied for a, a very short amount of time mm. but um you know, I think that there's a there's a essence of uh, loving your neighbor as yourself to walk them through the liturgy and to, to accept them in, but then also, you know, yeah, you don't want to change the core uh, of mm -hmm. of the message. You don't want to change the uh, you know the beauty and the treasures of what you actually have to just um, try to identify with every person. Mm -hmm. Did you find that a, a barrier? The length of the the Eucharist and the, the the liturgy, sorry, itself. Or? I, I not personally, but I have three kids. Uh, <laughs> so even uh, the last baptism started at seven thirty in the morning, and uh, I have a almost four year old, a two year old, and now a three month year old. So um, it, it does create a bit of a challenge to try to keep them still for that long. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's hard. It's hard to focus. Uh, it's it's one of those things. Uh, personally, um, you know, I. I I, I love that. Um, I, mm. that's once you start understanding and you're learning, uh, there's a depth that continues to come through that. Um, but yeah, there's, 
it comes with its challenges yeah. for sure. But uh, my kids are learning also. So, mm -hmm. and it's humbling, you know, when you have to chase your kid around and uh, you try to have to uh, humble yourself and mm -hmm. uh, know that you don't always have it all together, but we're there. Uh, we're mm -hmm. there. We showed up. And uh, so we keep, keep showing up is what, <laughs> what I used to say, keep showing up <laughs> and expect God to do great things. That's, That's awesome. awesome. Yeah. yeah. What about, yeah. What about uh, Coptic as a language? Um, you, are you okay with it? Uh, does does it allow you to? Uh, He's sitting next to a Coptic Orthodox priest. He's not going to be like, no, down with Coptic, <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know he's, he's, he can say whatever. Uh, I think there's a beauty to everything. I think there's yeah. a beauty to the Hebrew language. I think there's mm -hmm. an understanding that comes when we try to translate everything. Um, it, it loses its meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, I have no problem. Uh, I shouldn't say I have a, I, I don't see an issue with uh, trying to retain something that has such depth and beauty. Um, you know, for me personally, that's not where I am yet. I'd be interested to learn just like I'm interested to learn Hebrew, but, um, you know, you're, you, I can only, can only, uh, <laughs> retain so much, you right? You have three kids. Um, that's a nice exactly. project for now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Learning maybe Hebrew and in Coptic. In my retirement yeah. stage, maybe. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I think I, there's a beauty in everything, right? Mm. Um, but does, does you feel that it helps you? It hinders you? Um, and it's okay, like the, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, currently it uh, does, does neither um, for mm -hmm. me at the moment because I'm just trying to learn the liturgy and I'm just trying to understand everything else. Um, so it's one thing that I look forward to having a, a deeper understanding once I'm there. Mm. Yeah. Our podcast has turned into a workshop of <laughs> <laughs> the age-old battles of too much Coptic, not enough Coptic, sure. too much. In, that's every culture has that. Absolutely, in there. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's a richness to it too. I mean, mm -hmm. a, there's an envy that I have as well. I mean, when you, I, you know, I'm I'm an American, uh, German, Irish, uh, German, French, Irish mix, right? So mm -hmm. I don't have, uh, I don't have that beauty of a culture. Uh, I don't have those arguments uh, that sometimes you guys, you know, might get into over uh, cultural differences, right? It's just Usually not food, uh, yeah, food, food differences. You know. <laughs> Macarona bechamel. Yeah, makes there the you best go. one. You've made it, my friend. That's it. You don't need anything else. Your, your journey has ended. You're officially coffee. <laughs> You're officially, that's it. You're one of us. That's it. That's how it works. Uh, I've even rolled grape leaves before. No, no way. Yeah. You're joking. Yes, I, have. I haven't done that, it was man. What not, are you doing? Uh, it's oh, not as good as tons, but. Uh, you have way too yeah. much time on your hands. <laughs> COVID gave me a lot of time yeah, through, yeah. Rolling grape leaves. It's a big secret. They all buy it pre rolls. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a beauty in it, right? Mm -hmm. But there's also a beauty when you mix cultures. Mm -hmm. um, you can see everybody grow. And that that's what my hope would be also is is that, you know, your hearts would be open enough to have someone like myself or anybody else from Canada or the US to mm -hmm. walk through your doors and um not be worried, uh, because uh you have so much to offer. Mm. So forget a message to those who are non-Orthodox or non-Coptic. I want your parting words because, like you said, from glory to glory, this wasn't about, you know, debasing someone else or some other faith. Or it was more so deepening, right? Yeah. So I want your last message to be to us, those of us who are already in it, because the common thing we always discuss with the priests is when we're born into it, sometimes we take it for granted. Tell me and everyone like me what it is i'm taking for granted in my orthodox faith and what it means coming now from someone who sees it so vividly so that we can kind of rekindle that fire inside of us sure that's a that's a difficult answer uh question i'm gonna put you on the spot there i'm sorry um but i'll try i mean you know you know there's a the expression that you know you can be born with a golden spoon in your mouth and not even know it, not appreciate it. You know, you could have a Ferrari sitting in your driveway uh, when you're 16 years old and uh, not not appreciate it. Um, I think oftentimes that's what happens. Uh, you know, don't don't take for granted the beauty of uh, what God has birthed you into. Uh, and there's also a responsibility that that I would say that you were have been given to take that to all the nations, to take that to all the world, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, there are so many people, and I mean, just like myself, who I, I you know, I, I am grateful for what I was born into. Um, I'm grateful for what I have now, but there are so many people who um, are going through this wild and crazy world 
that have zero understanding of Christ. Um, and for those that were born into the Orthodox Church, I would say um, focus on the mission to go into all of the world. Uh, and this is part of the podcast that uh, you have right here. Um, the reason why I was willing to do this is because this has helped me, right? To just listen to somebody's perspective, uh, the, you know, an honest opinion, uh, an honest thought, an honest question. Uh, I would say uh, make sure that you're pressing into your relationship with the Lord uh, and make sure that you're not just simply doing something just because it, it was something that you were born into. Understand why and understand what God has given you and where it needs to go. I think that's the perfect note to end it. Thank you, Chad. What a blessing it was to have you today, Father, as always. And thank you all for joining us again.